everybody. I will start by sharing my screen. Let's see. Okay. Can, Martina, can you let me know if you can see my screen? I can see you. Yeah, I Great. can see your presentation. Okay, cool. Unfortunately, I can't see anybody, so please let me know. <laughs> um, well, we will be taking questions at the end, and there will be lots of time for that. So, um, yeah. In the meantime, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I literally just finished my PhD today, and I'm very tired. <laughs> <laughs> but it is on exactly these topics. So I am happy to share with you just some background on to help you understand what soil contamination is, what are some common types of soil contaminants to watch out for, um, and then what are some ways that you can address um, soil contamination in your backyard gardens or, um, you know, landscaping. Um, so Martina did a great job about um, going over the program goals, but um, the program was really founded to analyze the health of soils around Greater Victoria through this free heavy metal testing. Um, for people that are growing food, uh, we do have that data, those results up on a map online, which is kind of cool. You can see uh, what's what the soil metal levels are like in your neighborhood. Um, and then this, this type of thing. So the fact sheets um, that um, will be dropped in the chat and are also on the Compost Ed Center's website. Um, and then these workshops are how we share information about how to grow food safely. Um, if there, you know, may be or is known heavy metal contaminants in the soil. Oh yeah, this is an old um, just screenshot of the map, um, but yeah, kind of cool. And then just highlighting, um, yeah, one of the newer fact sheets that's out is actually on backyard um, bioremediation. So working with plants and fungi and um, compost and stuff to help build uh, soil health and um, potentially uh, clean up low levels of metals. Um, yeah, and just some pictures of some of the plots that uh, Martina mentioned, I think, um, that are part of the bioremediation pilot pro uh, project that's going on. And yeah, we'll be looking forward to sharing findings from that uh, once we have all the data back. So jumping in, just let's start with what is a soil contaminant and where does it come from? Uh, so there's two main groups of contaminants that are good to know about. One of them are the metals. Um, these are inorganic contaminants. So that means they're naturally occurring, but they are not carbon-based. Um, so examples of heavy metals that you may have heard of are arsenic, cadmium, copper, mercury, lead, but also chromium, zinc. Um, there's a whole bunch of um, different metals. Some of them are actually required by our bodies. So it's like, you know, I take a zinc supplement, for example. Um, so chromium and zinc are um, examples of metals that uh, we actually need in our bodies at certain concentrations, but at high, you know, above a certain concentration, those metals can be toxic to us um, and to other life. The, there are other metals though, like arsenic, cadmium, um, mercury, and lead that have no known biological function. And that means they're basically toxic to our bodies, um, even in small concentrations. So, um, yeah, this sort of category of metals are one of the major categories of contaminants to know about. Um, other things that are good to know about metals is that they uh, they don't break down. For, for all intents and purposes, they don't break down. Um, so they tend to accumulate in soils. So they can 
um, we'll get into like where they come from, um, but soils tend to sink and hold on to metals and because they don't break down, um, they accumulate in soils, um, which is sort of the basis for this whole project really. Um, and again, yeah, some of these are known uh, human carcinogens and have really um, no well-known toxic effects and adverse health effects. Um, so it's also a serious, um, you know, a serious thing um, to, to address. Um, yeah, and then the last thing I'll say about metals is that um, if you think back to like high school chemistry, um, it's what you see on the periodic table. So um, how do these metals get in soils? Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways, but um, here's some common ones. One is from the atmosphere. So um, this is especially the case near busy roads or freeways or highways. Um, they can also get into soils from uh, historical or present day pesticide, herbicide, and fertilizer application um, from irrigation water, uh, from mining, smelting, um, industrial activities, or uh, as a result of the infill um, from, from those industries. Um, and so I always, you know, when I started this project, I, uh, I learned a lot um, <laughs> about, you know, I think it can be surprising for some people, Victoria is the garden city, you know, it's hard to imagine that there could be toxic metals in the soils that grow such pretty flowers and things. But um, actually just, yeah, when cities were built, especially the case in Victoria, um, it, you know, there needed to be a lot of sort of flattening out, um, filling in marshes and things and, and, and just flattening hilly areas to, in order to build, you know, to build infrastructure, to build residential areas and things like that. And that, the fill, the infill, the soil stuff that was used to do that was not regulated whatsoever until the 1990s. So um, since you know, most of the, you know, that our city um, was developed prior to the 1990s. It means that it's possible that, um, you know, there's metals and other contaminants in soils, even in, a, you know, a residential neighborhood that didn't ever have any, uh, like a mine, you know, any mining or like an intense industry there. So I just like to bring up um, like surprising sources of metals um, because again these these you know exposure to these metals can be uh, toxic and so it's good for people to know um, uh, you know where they come from um, so that you're informed um, especially yeah again Victoria um, I mean I'm in I'm living um, like around LA right now and I think to some extent people like know it's polluted and kind of expect that. But um, <laughs> in, in Victoria, again, I think people are like, what, how could it be? How could it be polluted? It's so green. Um, so I like to bring up these points. Um, and then, yeah, the, the real, a real major contributor to lead, um, one of the more toxic metals in soils is from historical use of leaded gasoline um, and petroleum products, paints, um, and other products, uh, like batteries. Um, today, legally, I believe batteries are the only product that is, are allowed to contain lead, um, but lead is still used um, widely. So, um, and you'd, again, be, be surprised um, through working on this project, the um, gardens that we identified had the high, like really high lead concentrations were um, mostly the result of leaded paint chipping off of the, the house during renovation. And so most houses um, pre that were built pre 1970 something uh, were painted with leaded paint 
and um, it seems small, but those like flakes of paint that chip off can really contribute a lot of lead to soils right directly near, like directly adjacent to um, houses. And there's, there's a ton of information out there if you're curious about sources of or potential sources of contaminants. Um, there's um, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Control has these great fact sheets on each of these metals too, where you can see like where they come from, what are their health effects, um, how do they behave in soil and things like that. Um, another one, a few I'll point out that are relevant to Victoria area as well are, um, well, I mentioned pesticides, but I didn't say which metals. So a lot of pesticides contain, contain or contained arsenic, lead, and mercury, um, but also copper is really, uh, was really common and also chromium. Um, treated wood um, to the, still to this day um, contains um, arsenic and chromium. Um, and yeah, a lot of agriculture actually like orchards, um, but even like, um, animal agriculture, uh, there were a lot of, um, metal containing, uh, products used to either control pests or, um, or things like that. So yeah, lead, arsenic can be. And yeah, copper can be really common too in old orchards and even like dairies and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and actually one of our project partners, uh, Matt Dodd at Royal Roads University study, has studied um, metals a ton and did a project looking into, um, yeah, it was arsenic and, yeah, arsenic and chromium think concentrations in parks and yeah finding that yeah treated wood from like park benches and park um railing what are those called like trail you know trail supplies and stuff can actually like contribute metals into the soil so um yeah and then the other major category of contaminants other than the metals that we just talked about are the organic contaminants. And so these are carbon-based. Um, and examples would be um, it really any petroleum product or anything derived from that. Again, like, yeah, pest yeah pesticides, um, uh, all these other <laughs> um, persistent organic pollutants. Um, there's a lot of acronyms and stuff, but we don't actually test for organic contaminants in Healing City Soils program. Um, if you are concerned, I think, do I have a slide on that? If you're, you know, if you're trying to um, work on a project or a garden project or, you know, um, living on or near like a gas station or a laundromat, old laundromat, or sorry, dry cleaners, um, or like an old railway, track um you might have you might expect that there would be some petrochemicals um still left in the soil um so you can um test for those specifically um especially if you're going to be growing food or something like that um a thing that's handy about organic contaminants is that because they're carbon based they can degrade and be transformed um, into less or non-toxic forms, basically into soil by microbes. So um, that's a difference from the metals, which again, can't be, generally cannot be uh, broken down. So another really important thing to understand about contamination in soils is where it, uh, where it came from. And the reason that matters is because you want to make sure that they're not going to continue to be deposited. Um, so again, um, yeah, some ways contaminants can end up in soil. Again, air, so dust and exhaust are big pathways. Water, rain, groundwater, runoff from another site, 
Um, they can be directly deposited on a site, like through pesticide application, um, through burning garbage or nearby polluters. Um, disasters or spills can release uh, contaminants onto a site, um, or they could just be a legacy of historical land use. So, yeah, this is really important. Um, I always give an exa a personal example. Um, you know, I found this program. I was growing food, uh, living in different rental houses, different neighborhoods in the city. And for a while, I was growing a garden in James Bay, like literally right down the street from the fair or the, um, oh my goodness, the cruise ship terminal. And I was doing all the best practices. I was having my soil tested through the program for metals. <clears throat> And I was so confused why uh, there was these increases in, I think it was zinc and chromium um, and maybe lead. I'm trying to remember. There was a few metals that were increasing in the soil in my garden and I was so confused why. Um, and then I... Uh, I found some research on emissions from cruise ships and how um, within a few kilometers of a cruise ship terminal uh, where there's ships constantly coming in and sitting with their emissions going, um, those emissions can actually deposit metals through the air, <laughs> um, you know, onto soils um, in the surrounding area. So it was it was really interesting so i just bring that up as an example so um if you're someone who's growing food and you've gotten your soil tested once um it's really good to again try to identify <laughs> if there might be um ways that metals might continue to be deposited and that's just again for safety right so um that you don't think uh you know, say that you get a high metal um, result back and then you take action to reduce risks, you even bioremediate or you mulch up, we're gonna go through all those later. Um, just, um, yeah, if there's gonna be through the air ongoing deposition or through the water, you're gonna have to make sure you're taking action to reduce risk plan mitigates for those sources as well. And then, okay, so there's the, the metals themselves um, in the soil. Well, then how, how might we get exposed? Um, so this is super important, again, for later when we're trying to prevent exposures, right? Even if there's metals, um, as we'll get into, they're not causing you harm if you're not being exposed to them. So um, you can be exposed through your skin. Uh, like through touching soil that contains these metals. You can inhale dust that contains these metals. Um, they can be in water, uh, which you might drink. Um, if you're growing crops in metals contaminated soils, the metals may get into the crops, which you then would eat. That would be a source of exposure. For metals, soil vapors aren't really a thing. Um, those are for different organic contaminants. So should you be concerned? Uh, depends. That's what you want to do is establish how concerned you should be. What's the level of concern? And so this part of the workshop, we based on this amazing guide put out by Toronto, Toronto Public Health uh, for soil testing in urban gardens. Um, the link is here, but um, it has this handy checklist <laughs> that um, is based on your understanding of the land use historically um, and currently uh, for your site. So if um, your site has been um, residential, parkland, farmland, or child, I hesitate to say that. Um, again, remember there can be infill um, and there, that's, there still can be sources, but um, probably if it's been residential, or parkland or farmland, it's probably of low concern. Um, we still recommend it's just good to test. 
um, to know for sure. Um, if your site, uh, you know it was an infill area, it's, it was an orchard or is an orchard, um, it's along a hydro corridor, there was some type of commercial land use, excluding the really heavy polluting ones we'll go in next. Um, if it was located on or near a former landfill um, or within 30 meters of a rail line or a major road, um, or it's been, it was industrial land that has been remediated even, like cleaned up, they have different standards for cleanup of industrial land that are a lot higher uh, not higher, like meaning like they allow a lot more contamination than they do for residential um, or agricultural land. So um, the, any of these, um, if your site meets any of these criteria, it would be of medium concern. Um, of high concern would be if your, you know, site um, is or was a gas station, a dry cleaner, printing or auto body shop, industrial land rail yard, um, or even if there's just signs of dumping or burning. Um, yeah, and this can be really common, as you might know, like folks still, but um, folks used to really just like burn garbage a lot <laughs> in the backyard. And I've worked on sites in Fernwood that, again, it's kind of like, why, why would this site be contaminated? And then you find you find out from the neighbor that um, a whole bunch of garbage was burnt back there. Um, so that can um, that can be a really bad source of contamination because when a bunch of stuff gets burnt, I'm not talking about like a campfire, you know, but like, um, yeah, like a house or different, a whole bunch of different stuff. It basically not only releases everything that was in that, the plastics, the metals, the dyes, the, you know, whatever, the oil, um, it puts it all in the soil, but actually certain uh, toxic stuff can be made even more toxic when it's burnt. So um, it creates these whole new compounds that can be extra toxic too. So um, that would be, any of these would be a high concern. And this is like a lot of info, but I'm just trying to um, share that there are actually a lot of great resources out there about this. This list is from Cornell Waste Management Institute. It has um, a super detailed checklist as well to help you establish the level of concern. Um, if you wanna check out, um, these can be really handy and they're all available for free online. And actually, I think we have links. I'm pretty sure we have links to all these resources in the soil contamination fact sheet. So, um, okay. So then you want to test the soil. This is probably a good idea, anyways. Um, things to consider when you're testing the soil. Uh, again, that's why you do that first part. Um, learn about the land use history, which I forgot to say. If you're wondering how to do that. The best way I've found is just talking to older neighbors, um, which is also pleasant, <laughs> typically. Um, but you can also go down to City Hall and, um, and get records on your neighborhood or even your site. Um, but yeah, um, there's a lot you can find out just by talking to neighbors or if you want going, going to City Hall um, about the land use history where you are. Um, and that will really help you understand what contaminants do you expect to be present. Um, and the reason that matters is because it's pretty expensive to test soil. So um, it'll save you money if you know uh, what, what you're looking for specifically or what you expect to find. Um, really important questions too are how do you interact with the site and what are your goals for the site? So if you grow a garden, like a food garden, um, that is really important. Um, if you have pets that spend time outside or children that play outside on the site, these are really important considerations. Um, and um, if any of these are true, I would just say definitely test your soil. Um, and uh, it, 
these different um, uses might affect the depth that you test. So if you have pets um, or children that spend time outside, they're more likely to be interacting with the surface of the soil. So you would want to take really shallow, so like surface soil samples. Um, if you're growing a veggie garden, you would want to take samples between the surface and about a foot or so um, because most roots of plants can reach about that deep. And that means they could pull up metals um, from that depth as well. Okay, so you've tested your soil. Is your soil contaminated? So I remember when I started doing this, I would get soil test results back and be like, I have no idea what this means. Um, it's just a whole bunch of numbers. So um, we really want to go through how to understand soil test results. Um, and Martina, are these, I tried to correct these last week and then I wasn't sure if they had saved. Please let me know if they um, are not looking correct. Um, They're correct. Yay. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. So the reason, so what I'm showing here are uh, just a comparison of three different agencies um, within Canada's uh, limits or guidelines um, for these different metals um, of concern, for these different heavy metals. And so before I get into it, I'll just say that these limits really vary greatly um, by, you, like by city, by agency, by country. Um, yeah, it's pretty wild. So Canada has pretty, like, um, in some cases higher than European countries, um, but definitely lower than um, American uh, limits, uh, allowable limits for these metals. It's super uh, political, these um, guidelines. Um, so that's why we're wanting to compare them a bit here. Uh, within Healing City Soils program, we tend to be uh, the most cautious and health protective. Um, and, and so we tend to go with the Canadian Council for, of Ministers of the Environment, CCME, it's a federal um, set of regulations or limits. Um, and we use their agricultural limits. Um, so within each agency that sets limits for contaminants in soils, there will usually be different limits that are allowed depending on the land use. Like before I said, um, if it's an industrial land use, they're allowed to have a lot higher levels of every contaminant, pretty much. Um, residential um, limits tend to be lower than industrial, and that's because people can be more exposed to the contaminants. Um, uh, agricultural limits tend to be even lower than residential limits, and that's because there's more routes of exposure. So remember, if you're um, gardening or growing food, you're directly interacting with the soil. So you could touch it, inhale it, plus you're eating crops that were grown in the soil. Um, so these limits are supposed to be based on um, the risk of exposure. Um, so yeah, so um, we tend to use the CCME agricultural limits. Um, and I'm also putting here though, for your information, Toronto Public Health's um, limits that were set specifically for urban gardens. And you can see that in some cases, um, they are, the Toronto Public Health limits are lower. Um, and then in some cases they're higher. So um, we have for lead, um, we have a limit of 70 milligrams per kilogram, um, micro or micro. Yeah. We can get into units later. Um, we have a limit of 70, um, as compared to a limit of 34. Um, 
what else? But then for copper and zinc, um, the allowable limits are actually higher <laughs> according to Toronto Public Health. So we just wanted to, sometimes when you get soil test results back, they will give you the limits. Um, sometimes they say what they are, sometimes they don't. If you get um, memos back from Healing City Soils, we give um, these limits so you have something to compare to. Um, I'm not going to go over organic contaminant guidelines because we don't test for that in this program, um, but that information is available um, if you're concerned about and going to be testing for organic contaminants. So um, this is really important. Um, the test results that you get back are telling you the total concentration of each of the metals tested in the soil sample that was taken. Um, so um, I just want to go through some toxicology stuff that I learned in grad school um, that I think is really helpful to help make sense of something like a total concentration of contaminants. Um, and it's important because I know it can be really scary to get test results back that show that there's a level that's higher than, um, than you know, the guideline. So um, hazard is different than risk. So hazard is something that has the potential to harm you. So in this example, you know, a shark um, has the potential to harm us. Risk is the likelihood of a hazard causing harm. So if you're on the beach, um, the shark is a hazard. There is no risk because the shark will not get out of the water and attack you on the beach. Um, if you're swimming in the water where there's sharks, then there's a risk. Um, so the risk is just, again, that likelihood of a hazard causing harm. Um, there's this other uh, cartoon here that's helpful um, at driving this um, point home even further. So risk equals hazard. So something that has the potential to harm you like lead times by exposure. So which we've been talking about already, right? And so the example here is the sun. So the sun is a hazard. Um, but if you're not exposed to it, it's not a risk. So I hope that makes sense. Um, because what we're going to switch over to soon is how you can reduce your exposure, which will reduce the risk, even if you have metals in your soils. Um, so going specifically to what we're talking about, the risk to you is equal to the total concentration of the metals and contaminants in your soil, plus how bioavailable they are to you, how available they are to you, which we'll define, plus the exposure scenario. So what is bioavailability? It's, um, so bioavailable portion is the amount of a substance, so a heavy metal like lead, that can directly affect plants, animals, like humans, um, because it can be taken up by our bodies. So there's a lot of factors in soil that affect bioavailability for metals. Um, and these include soil texture and clay content, the pH or um, acidity of the soil, the amount of organic matter in the soil, the soil moisture and temperature, and the presence of other contaminants potentially. So um, yeah, going even deeper into soil, um, yeah, like how metals behave in soils and how that is relevant to us in terms of preventing exposures as gardeners. Um, there's a couple of things that can happen to metals in soils. One is that they can absorb or bind to um, stuff in the soil. So, um, for example, like soil particles, um, organic matter, and 
It's like it sounds. So adsorption or binding just means that the metal is attached to um, something in the soil or the soil itself. So that means it's not very likely to dissolve in water or be taken up by plants or things like that. On the other hand, um, we have solubility and mobility. So this is how likely is it that a metal or contaminant will dissolve in water um, and how movable is that contaminant or metal in the soil? So is it going to um, move with water when it rains? Is it going to move when it's irrigated? Um, is it going to be taken up by plants? Um, so these are really important concepts um, that help us understand and mitigate risk um, from metals in soils as gardeners. So um, we'll give some specific examples with specific metals. So, um, and these are both um, toxic metals. Um, so there's no known function for these metals. Lead is actually, tends to be pretty immobile in soils. It tends to be um, really bound up with organic matter, um, with clay, um, and it's really unlikely, unless the soil lead concentrations are super, super high, um, or the soil and, and or the soil is uh, quite acidic um, and very, very low in carbon or organic matter, it's very unlikely that the lead will actually get into your veggies that you're growing. Um, it's way more likely that the lead would be stuck on the outside of the veggies, like in the, um, you know, dirt on the roots or the organic matter or the clay or whatever that's outside of the crops. Um, or even like dust that's on the lettuce or whatever. Um, uh, cadmium, though, is, is a different story. It's one of the most bioavailable metals. Um, so it's more likely than other metals to be taken up by plants, especially um, leafy plants, leafy greens. Um, this is especially true if the soil is uh, acidic as well. So um, you might notice that we're kind of funneling into things that you can do to prevent exposure and like best practices for gardening safely if you're concerned there might be metals or you know that there are. Um, this is a lot of text, but I'm just gonna pull out the most important parts about lead. Um, and the reason I'm focusing a lot on lead is because it's really, um, again, it's a, it's a very toxic metal. It's been spread everywhere um, because it was used in so many products for so long. Um, and it's especially of concern for children. Um, children do not have, like as adults, um, there's a lot of um, protection that our bodies give to us. A lot of ways that even if we get exposed to lead, it's not as harmful for us. But for children, um, they don't have those protections yet. And so lead can be very damaging to the nervous system and brain um, uh, within children and can lead to um, behavioral you know, challenges, um, learning um, impacts, and just all sorts of other sort of neurological effects. So it's super important. Um, so yeah. Um, we're, we're focusing a lot on lead. <laughs> so um, what you can do um, if you have lead or you're concerned you might have lead in your soil, don't plant within 10 feet of buildings or alongside busy roads. Um, yeah, and again, the 10 feet of buildings thing is because of the leaded paint chipping off into the soil. The alongside busy roads thing is because lead used to be in gasoline and it doesn't break down. So it's probably still hanging out in soil alongside um, busy roads. Um, you can maintain a neutral soil pH. Remember, lead is more mobile, less bound up if the soil is acidic. So if you keep your soil around neutral and add a lot of organic matter to your soil, um, organic matter really binds on to lead. 
strongly. So um, that will really help prevent it from moving into crops or spreading around. Um, you can apply mulch, um, thick layers of mulch. Uh, don't leave the soil bare so that um, if there's lead in the, you know, you're preventing it from getting mobilized as dust. Um, you can thoroughly wash veggies and peel root veggies um, to get the lead that's most likely on the outside of those crops off. Um, phosphorus naturally helps bind lead into a form that's um, less soluble in soil. Um, so chicken manure, fish bones, um, and really any type of phosphorus rich um, amendment will help with that. And, you know, if the concentrations are high, you might want to avoid growing leafy and root veggies. Uh, cadmium will go through and then I think, yeah, and then we'll take our break. Um, so cadmium is one that we can see often as well in soil test results. Um, the, it has a sort of surprising source um, that's um, very mundane. Um, I guess one of the main sources of cadmium in soils, especially agricultural or garden soils, um, is actually phosphate fertilizers. So the same bedrock that phosphate, phos like phosphorus um, um, fertilizers are mined from, uh, cadmium tends to co-occur. And so I think it's regulated now, but it wasn't for a long time. Um, and that, again, cadmium isn't going to break down. So um, it's probably still in the soil. But um, remember that this metal is, a spe is way more bioavailable. So it's way more likely to get taken up into crops and plants. And it's a known human carcinogen. Um, so um maintaining a neutral soil ph will help avoid growing especially leafy vegetables if you have high cadmium um, or grains um, which are also known to take up cadmium um, you can phytoremediate it which is because it's available to plants and they will take it up meaning you can intentionally plant um, plants that you will not eat but you will um, hope will pull the cadmium out of the soil so that your soil is then uh, has reduced concentrations of the cadmium. And there's info about that in the bioremediation fact sheet I mentioned earlier. Um, and so um, with that, uh, we can take our break. And when we come back, we will discuss um, just more like general best practices for how you can uh, safely garden and grow food and um, take action to reduce risks from soil metals. What time should we come back, Martina? Um, well, we'll give everybody 10 minutes. Um, okay just to, you know, stretch your legs, grab a drink. For those of you sticking around, um, I've put in the chat links to all the fact sheets that Danielle was referencing. So um, while you're waiting, you can look through those as well. So let's say um, two minutes after seven, we'll, we'll meet back yep. here. I'll keep okay. the recording running just to make things okay. easy on our end. But uh, yeah, see you in 10 minutes. Cool. Thanks.
All righty. Um, welcome back. Uh, if somebody can just give me a thumbs up or a little wave and let us know that you're back online, we can continue on. I got a little hand there, got some thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Um, Danielle, go ahead. <sighs> Sorry, unmuted now. Um, <laughs> okay. And you can see my screen? Yep. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, should you stop growing food? if your soil has heavy metals or other contaminants in it, uh, please don't. Um, we, you know, there's so many uh, well documented benefits to health in so many different ways to gardening and growing your own food. Um, and there's so many ways that you can reduce the risks of gardening and growing food, even if there are um, some metals in the soil. Um, so we're going to um, go through best practices that uh, we recommend any gardener follow, regardless of whether you know that you uh, your soil contains metals or not. Um, they're just generally <laughs> good practices for safe um, gardening and also just for growing uh, a healthy garden. So, um, yeah, um, taking action to reduce risks. Um, <laughs> going back to that really handy uh, set of guidelines from Toronto Public Health, their urban gardening manual, um, your the practices that you might follow will depend on the level of concern uh, and the level of contamination. So if you identified that you were at a low level of concern, um, you would want to use good gardening practices anyways, which would include washing your hands after gardening and always before eating um, and washing your produce with soap and water. If you uh, we're in that medium concern category. Uh, you would want to follow those good gardening practices and lower the concentration of contaminants by adding clean soil and organic matter. So compost, manure, um, leaf mulch, things like that, straw to the existing soil. So adding organic matter again will um, not only create um, stuff for those metals to bind onto and reduce their mobility, but it will also help neutralize the soil pH in general. So um, remember that for many metals of concern, they're more mobile, more likely to, um, you're more likely to be exposed to them if um, the pH of your soil is more acidic. Um, so it's a lower pH and um, there's like, low levels of carbon, organic matter. Um, also adding like compost and stuff will also kind of tend to dilute the, their concentrations as well. Um, you wanna reduce any potential for dust exposure by covering bare soil with ground cover. It could be a living ground cover um, or mulch. So thick layers of Wood chips um, are a good call, just generally not good to have bare soil um, for so many reasons, um, but including, uh, yeah, you just don't want that exposure through dust when it gets windy or um, whatnot. Um, and you want to peel root vegetables before you eat or cook them. Uh, again, yeah, the it's it's a lot more likely for most metals um, like lead that they will be stuck in the dirt on the outside of the vegetable um, rather than inside the veggie itself. Um, there are certain types of crops that are known to pull up um, or accumulate metals more than others. So we'll go through that next. Um, 
So yeah, if you're at a medium concern level, you'd want to avoid growing um, like probably root veggies um, and some of the other ones we'll go through in a minute. If you're at a high concern level, um, you want to follow all of those practices we just mentioned. Um, definitely make sure there's absolutely no um, bare soil at all. Um, so again, ground cover or mulch. Um, you might consider growing your veggies in raised bed gardens that are at least, um, what is that, 16 inches? Yeah, that are like a foot and a half or so um, deep. And the, that depth is about the typical rooting depth for most plants, uh, plant crops. Um, and then you'd want to fill those raised beds with clean soil um, and then um, probably line the bottom, prevent contact between the contaminated soil and the clean soil you're growing in above by putting down some landscape fabric or something. Um, you can also grow in containers. Um, and then you want to be adding clean soil like or compost and organic matter at least annually. Um, compost manure, um, many of you probably follow these practices anyways just for a healthy garden, but they're also good for minimizing exposure to heavy metals in soils. Um, or again, if you're at a high concern um, level for your site, you might consider growing only nut and fruit trees. Um, and we'll explain why um, in a minute, I think next. Actually, that's a little bit, a few slides later. Um, okay, so just going through these practices in more detail, it is really important to wash uh, your garden veggies thoroughly before you eat them. And I actually saw studies that showed that for lead, again, this um, really concerning metal that's really present um, kind of all over, um, you can remove about 80% of the lead by just washing your veggies. And so um, from the studies I saw, um, it looked like you'd want to do that with soap and water or with um, a diluted vinegar solution. Um, leave the soil in the garden, right? That's your exposure. <laughs> so um, if you take away the exposure, um, the metals in the soil are just a hazard. Um, so you can do that by, you know, maybe you have a, a set of gardening clothes that you, um, and, and gardening uh, like boots or shoes or clogs or whatever um, that you leave outside. Um, so you're not tracking potentially contaminated soil into your house. Um, always washing your hands. You might have garden gloves, um, hopefully, that you wear for gardening that you also leave outside and then wash your hands after, too. Um, these are just some ways to try to leave soil in the garden. Um, this is an, another really important component to leaving soil in the garden is just making sure there isn't um, bare soil. Again, uh, especially, like, in general, I would just say, um, but especially if you have pets that go outside um, or children that play in the yard. Um, yeah, you just really want to have thick layers of um, mulch or wood chips or um, something so that there isn't bare soil that could be blowing around or, you know, people could be in contact with. This will also, remember, help um, add carbon that will bind up those metals and make it make them essentially immobilized in the soil so they're not getting into your plants or into the water or anything um, and it will have the added benefit of also like probably helping neutralize the soil um, pH so that again most metals will be um, relatively immobile don't grow edible produce um, directly adjacent to buildings or busy streets, like I said before. Um, yeah, unfortunately, there's been quite a bit of research on this, and it, um, yeah, just tends to be the, like, a lot more 
lead, especially, um, but sometimes other metals, um, like along boulevards and right next to houses. Um, so backyard growing tends to be best or um, at least just not um, directly by the road or directly um, near the house or building. Uh, maintain a, a neutral soil pH that will help you grow most crops anyways. Um, and um, yeah, I believe the, the compost ed center has a lot of great fact sheets on um, just really lots of like how, like there's a fact sheet on mulching. Um, there might be a fact sheet on that covers like how to maintain a good soil pH. Um, I know compost can really help with that too. So if you want more resources on that, um, there's a lot of great resources through the compost ed. Yeah, really, um, if you have young children spending time, um, uh, in your garden or on your site and you know that there's metals in the soil um, in general, but especially for lead, just I would really um, encourage, uh, you know, yeah, like fencing off or some type of barriers. Um, at the least, you don't want the, there to be really any ac like access to the soil, um, the contaminated soil, right? Um, so again, if you have, you know, this could look like, uh, you know, really thick layers of mulch um, over contaminated soil like wood chips, and then you build raised beds that you can happily garden with your kids in, you know, with, with clean soil, um, you know, that that's one idea. But um, yeah, really, really important, especially for children to not be exposed to metals. And children, the, it's a um, dual thing because they're most impacted by exposures, um, but they're also most likely to be exposed because children will, like, they, they tend to, they'll eat soil literally, um, but also just put um, their hands in their mouth a lot. And so it's, that's why it's such a, it's such an important thing to make sure that there isn't that exposure. Um, and again, um, it might end up being a good idea to grow in raised beds um, and or container gardens. That's an option too. Um, yeah, and then bring in clean soil and then, um, yeah, prevent that contact with the roots of plants into the contaminated soil. Okay, and um, finally, um, we will go through the most and least suitable crops for contaminated soil. Um, but I do want to heavily disclaim, um, I'm going to go through these as general principles, but, um, you know, there's so many things that can affect this. Um, so again, these are very general principles and, um, uh, there's definitely lots of studies and cases showing uh, differently. So if, you know, for example, like certain types of metals, again, cadmium, um, they're probably going to be taken up by the plants, um, even if it's on this list as a, you know, plant that tends to be more safe. Um, other examples would be yeah, if the concentrations are really high, um, those can really overwhelm any plant defenses. Um, and um, yeah, so and there's so many soil properties and just different things that can affect um, what we're about to share. So I'm just kind of, I'm gonna share these, um, but just keep in mind they're really general guidelines. And if you're actually, um, you know, if, if you have a, I would just say, like, really, we recommend following all those best practices. So um, if you have soil that is like a, is like um, contaminated, I would probably just recommend, you know, to be safe, grow, you could grow in a raised bed, um, in clean soil, um, or things like that, like follow all those best practices we talked about. Um, rather than risk, you know, <laughs> um, based on like super general 
guidelines we're about to share. So I just, I'm, I'm just saying this because I've been working around this stuff for over a decade, like for a long time. And I've tested a lot of plants and I've tested a lot of soils and I've seen things that totally contradict what um, is on here. So that's another thing I'll say too, is that in addition to being able to get soil testing done, um, the labs that we recommend locally also are able to test um, vegetables and, and crops. So if you're really, you know, moving forward with gardening and contaminated soil, um, it might be good to have some of your crops tested just to be, just for peace of mind to, to make sure that they're okay. Okay. So in general though, um, the most suitable crops are any type of fruit, seed, um, so berries, um, tree fruits, um, certain vegetable fruits and seeds as well, um, like tomatoes, um, melons, generally are okay. I'm going to go through why um, in a minute, but still keep in mind that, especially if these are fruits that you collect, uh, like from, that have been resting on the ground, um, you're going to want to still wash them um, with soap and water with like a diluted vinegar to get any of the dust or dirt off that might be contaminated. Generally, the least suitable crops for growing contaminated soils would be green leafy veggies. So like lettuce and chard and spinach and kale, collards, cabbage, um, veggies like broccoli and cauliflower, um, root crops, carrots, potatoes, turnips, um, beets, um, and grains. Grains are actually literally um, used um, to remediate soil, so to pull metals out of soils. So they are really good in general at um, accumulating metals. Um, so it's um, good, to, good to know. Um, and then, so why, like why, how do we have these general principles? Um, well, plants have natural barriers to limit heavy metal transfer. It's because those metals are toxic to them as well. So um, there's a barrier between, uh, like at the roots, um, there's a barrier then if, so say then the metals get into the roots, um, there's another barrier that plants have um, to prevent uh, metals from going from roots to shoots. And then because um, fruit is what carries seeds, which are the most precious, like the reproductive part of plants, um, the, there's another barrier between the shoots and the fruits. And so that's why generally it's said that fruits are the safest to grow in contaminated soil and roots are the least safe. They're in direct contact with the soil um, and there's only one barrier between, um, you know, to prevent that versus the, the few. So generally, um, most plants, if they will take up metals from the soil, they're likely to be highest in the roots and lowest in the fruits and seeds. Um, but <laughs> a, a reminder that plants can also be contaminated from the air. Um, or from the garden soil, like, I mean, like garden soil stuck outside of the plants. So uptake by the plant roots is only one of the ways that um, crops can become contaminated. Um, so, and if you're wondering, okay, well, what if um, I live near the cruise ship terminal or, you know, I think there, I live near a busy road and there might be deposition through air. Um, a pretty simple way you can limit that is by, um, using row covers on your crops so you can get those um, row covers um, like uh, that fabric basically that you can put on top of um, your crops as just a physical barrier that will collect that the, those emissions um, and prevent them from actually like 
getting onto your crops. But again, even if you have, um, if you have deposition by air, um, you can also really deal with that by washing, right? So that's why, like, we really recommend following all of those best practices. Um, they're pretty simple to do, but they will generally um, keep you pretty safe. Um, so even if there's deposition by air, if you're washing your crops, you're getting rid of most of that. Um, you just got to consider that um, there might be metals being added into the soil as well, which then could go up into the crops. So, um, yeah, and if you're not growing food, um, but you have contaminated soil in your, um, on your property, um, you still want to just keep those soils covered with sod or non-edible plants, mulch or wood chips um, to prevent that contact and ingestion or exposure through dust. Um, you might want to fence highly contaminated areas to prevent children from playing there. Um, and you might want to consider remediation options. That might be true of any, any of you. Um, if you um, have established a medium or um, high level of concern, or you've gotten test results showing that you have elevated beyond guidelines levels of metals. Um, and so with that, we will conclude today's workshop and then open for questions. And I'm just going to pause my screen sharing so I can see people <laughs> and see the questions. Maybe if no questions are coming up uh, right off the bat, uh, perhaps I'll prompt some of you and ask if um, anybody noticed any high levels on their soil test results and if they've um, done any sort of investigation on their property to try to figure out where it's coming from. Um, maybe some folks can share their ideas. Um, alternatively, maybe some of you have already done some research uh, about addressing uh, low or medium levels of contamination. And um, maybe you could share what you've been doing to try to address that? While we wait for the gears to turn, um, I'll just mention too that the Compost Education Center maintains a list of um, helpful resources for the community, which includes um, suppliers uh, for mulch, um, wood chips, seeds, um, yeah, all, all kinds of different things. So I'll throw that into the chat as well. Did Reagan have a hand up? I wasn't sure if that was a question or it was oh, yeah, that's before. Right. Oh, no worries. <laughs> yeah, and if it doesn't work, you're welcome to type your question or comment into the chat as well. Okay. Hi, Cadmium. Five times the agricultural guidelines. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, do you what? So basically, um, what I would recommend is is following the practices. Like, if you have a soil pH that's around neutral, and you have a good amount of organic matter in your soil, um, it's it's that's going to help the cadmium stay in the soil. Um, another option is to intentionally do, you know, one or more rounds of, um, essentially cover cropping with known 
plants that um, can can hopefully pull some of that out of the soil. Um, and we have sort of a like proposals for how to how to do that um, in the bioremediation fact sheet. Um, and then another thing that you can do as well, if you're concerned, is um, like I mentioned to test um, some of your veggies directly. Um, uh, and so MB Labs um, can offer that type of testing. I don't remember offhand the cost for testing um, like veg uh, plant materials, but I don't think it was much different than their, what was it, $170 or $100 for soils? Yeah, it's around $100 for soils, around $150 for plants. And that okay. includes about eight, eight leaves. Um, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. That's so helpful. <laughs> um, and yeah, and then the other thing I don't think I said in this workshop that's also important to keep in mind is um, if you got testing through the Healing City Soils program, you would have gotten about two samples taken. Um, and so it's important to note that soils are very heterogeneous and um, what that means is that there can be really different metal concentrations, like, you know, over an area, even a small area. Um, and I've seen this a lot. Um, so it's possible that the, those samples are representative of your three samples. Okay, see, there you go. So it sounds like you stumbled upon a, a hotspot for cadmium. Um, in your in your site, and so um, another another option could be if you um, again follow all the best practices just to be safe. I would say, but you, I, I wonder if you could treat that particular spot that sample was taken as a hot spot, and then change the type of you know crop. Maybe you you could do um, a fruit there. Um, Maybe you want to just mulch that area and then shift shift over to focus on the other two, um, the areas the other samples were taken. Um, so there's a there's a lot you can there's a lot you can do and um, yeah and I also it's it's just it's trying to strike a balance between wanting people to have all the information and be safe and as cautious as possible. So that's what we're trying to do. And at the same time, like, it's pretty wild. Anyways, <laughs> having studied environmental toxicology now, like you can go on, there's um, national studies that are done of food from grocery stores every year, not to freak people out, but just, it's very possible that like, like we are, we definitely are um, exposed to cadmium through food that we don't grow ourselves too. So not, I'm not trying to like, anyways, hopefully that was helpful. Maintain your neutral soil pH, um, mulch, make sure there's organic matter. You could kind of drop that spot that had the high results. Um, you could do further testing um, of the crops or just, your general garden area to see if that was kind of an anomaly or a hotspot or if it seems representative. Um, yeah, so and then just following all the best practices, there's there's a lot you could do. And again, you can try um, bioremediation um, and you can check out the fact sheet for for how to do that. Um, and you might just have to do that for that one spot. Thanks, Danielle. Um, Erica also has their hand up. Yes, hi there. Um, I have um, a question. That bioremediation fact sheet. How do I access it? I, I don't see. I haven't seemed to have figured that out. Can you no worries. Um, so you should yeah. be able to click on the link in the. Um, let me try it and see if it works. Yeah, so. Oh, yes. Oh, there I've got it now. Okay. Nice. So, so, okay. All right. Great. Okay. Yeah, good. and we'll be doing, um, I think the plan is to be actually um, adding a workshop on that once we have the results from our own 
pilot studies. Um, okay. So, but right now this is just a general, uh, you know, framework. We suggest plants um, by metal, um, including native plants and um, non-native plants that are known to accumulate cadmium or other metals. I'm not sure what metals you might have, but there's there's a list, a nice table. Um, a lot of them are are ones that are um, pretty straightforward to access. Honestly, the Compost Ed Center might have seeds for a bunch of these. Um, yeah, and so it, but it basically looks like, I mean, it involves skills that you all probably already practice. I mean, you basically, you know, prepare the area, sow the seeds. Um, once they grow, um, you harvest that plant material um, and you'd want to keep, um, you'd want to have a way to contain that plant material. I just do it in um, garbage bins or buckets that don't have holes. Um, and then, you know, retest the soil and then see if you need to do another round. Um, that's a very simple, very, very, very simple overview um, of, of, yeah, bio, bioremediation with plants for, for metals. Um, and it's, it's, it can be really effective if there's low levels of, low but elevated levels of metals. Um, and I know people, yeah, might wonder what does that mean? What I mean is, um, you know, say the limit is, um, for lead is 70 and you have 80 um, parts per million of lead, um, uh, you know, or something like that. That, that would, might be a case in which it, it, um, it might be feasible to get the levels below the, uh, the screening limits or the guidelines um, without, with just a, a few rounds of planting. Okay. Well, which um, cover crops do you recommend? Is it specific cover crops for certain metals? How about copper? Or I know cadmium, you said, is, uh, is something that gets taken up by the grains and so on. Would you mind running through different um, specific cover crops that are most beneficial? That's my first part of my question. And then the second part is how much time between cover cropping and retesting would you suggest? Is that, are you looking at a one year, two year, or is it less time? I would do it after each season. I mean, um, yeah, when I lived up um, in Victoria, I mean, it's nice because we can do, we can basically grow year round. Um, so what I would do is I would alternate um, cr cover crops. So I would do, you know, a winter one, I would sow in, you know, November um, and sow, um, uh, you know, buckwheat or barley or, or something like that. And then, but it depends on the metals you have, but, um, you know, and then maybe you do a spring, uh, so you do a spring planting if you can, it depends how high, like your metal concentrations are, but if you could retest the soil after each um, after each cropping cycle, that would be the most fine tuned so that you would know if you need to keep going or not. Um, but other plants, so for copper, um, uh, non-native plants that are pretty easy to grow and access are sunflower, um, mugwort, uh, native plants include willow and small fescue, um, yeah, there's there's sort of a, a whole list. You'll see a lot of them um, will pull up a whole range of metals out of the soil. They're not, you know, selective necessarily. They just are really good at pulling up um, nutrients out of the soil. And then it happens that they also will take up metal, um, which are mm -hmm. very similar. Yeah, alfalfa um, is another one. Um, wheat, even um, garden sorrel. Um, yeah, what else? Um, those ones are all pretty easy to get seeds for. Red clover. Um, different types of clover can be good, actually. Um, and you can kind of um, intercrop, like you could have, you know, um, sunflower or whatever, and then um, under sown with. Uh, clover, for example. Okay. 
Something I just want to add on to that, Danielle, is that, um, you know, one of the goals of the program is to reduce barriers to this type of soil testing. And so um, anyone who has been involved in the program in previous years ha are invited to reapply for subsequent years. And if, for example, you have your soil tested and it's showing very high levels and then you take the next year to try to address those concerns using a bioremediation technique, I think that if you were to apply to the Healing City Soils program again, you'd be a really strong candidate and make a very strong case to be retested for free through the program because it would also help us use that data as well. Um, mm. Yeah, and so I, I just want to let you all know too that that's always a, a possibility. Um, with that, I will say that um, each year we do receive quite uh, the number of applications uh, for the Healing City Souls program. And um, historically, our capacity to run the program has been dependent on the number of university students available to actually run the soil testing in the university lab. Um, and because of our reduced capacity for this coming year, uh, we're currently scheming up a plan for more of a citizen, citizen science approach where um, homeowners might collect the samples themselves and, and um, bring them to the compost center. And then we would uh, coordinate the testing from that point forward. Um, but we're working at the details right now, um, or at least in the in the next coming months. And um, it could also be the case that we have to actually halt the program for a year altogether, just because we don't have um, that student team to run the tests. But um, you can follow the Compost Education Center on social media, Facebook and Instagram, or our website for updates on that. But um, yeah, we'll keep the community updated on those plans as they get developed. Does anybody else have any questions? I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, I have this Regan is typing. Oh. Ah. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, if you if you enjoyed this workshop, if you enjoyed participating in the program, we would really appreciate if you could spread the word to your friends um, or your neighbors. Um, also, if you have any questions that come to mind after uh, we conclude the workshop um, or if you want to keep in touch or if you want to provide feedback on the workshop or the program, um, I'll welcome you to uh, send us an email. I'll type the email in the chat right now. Alrighty. Well, thank you all. Um, have a great night. I will stop the recording. Uh, one last thing, uh, the recording will be available to all the participants um, and that will come through to your emails uh, in a couple of days. And you have about, uh, we typically put a time limit on that and I think it's 30 days to, to, to um, view it and then uh, review all the information that Danielle provided and take down your notes. So um, that will be coming to you soon. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great evening. Yes, thank you very much for all the information. Thank you, Danielle and Martina. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Our pleasure. <laughs> Take care. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.